In the early 20th century, Almont, which was nicknamed the Little Manchester of Canada, had a dozen woolen mills operating simultaneously. By 1960, it was becoming a victim of the worldwide downturn in the woolen industry. Most mills were gone, including the Thoburn, which closed in 1956, hurt by the rise in popularity of cotton-based blue jeans. By 1960, there were only two textile mills remaining. The former Rosamond No. 1 mill, now owned by Zephyr Textiles, maintained a reduced but still substantial workforce. The Collie Woolen Company was employing 75 people in the former Penman plant on Mill Street. But fortunately, textiles were not the only game in town. The flour mill and producers' dairy were still in full operation, as was Peterson's ice cream, owned by Louis Peterson. Louis. Oh, Louis. Louis. I worked in the office and uh, did the books. And Louis, every, well, I don't know, when Lowell Green was on, he'd drive out the old Kirk Road, listen to Lowell Green, and then come back and sit in the chair and we'd have to discuss it. We went through politics, through religion, to sex, you name it. We discussed that with Louis. And I thought it was a great place to work. And if I didn't have anything to do in the books, I'd go back and fill the ice cream. Now the big tubs, they were easy. And then I got good about filling with the two-liter things. And you could fill them and you put it there and then you tie it up and push it back and do that. And I even got down to the little pints, but then they would make the machine go faster. All of a sudden, they went, and I like that was the thing, and I grabbed a tub. But it was, it was fun place. I, I enjoyed it very much, yeah. There was something else about Louis that was memorable. I lived in fear of how he drove. <laughs> Louis was a, a unique, unique character, very good businessman. I mean, Peterson's ice cream was known far and wide. But Louis never parked his car, he kind of abandoned it. <laughs> there was yet another aspect of Louis, which, by his own wishes, wasn't so well known. My father was uh, uh, very, very good friends uh, with uh, Mr. Peterson. I remember my father uh, telling me, uh, when we were in a shoe store, young children would come in periodically and come up and say, are you Mr. Scott? And he would say yes, and he, and he said, I've been sent here by Mr. Peterson to get shoes or to get uh, boots, whatever. And another uh, uh, incident uh, that, or, that I've learned about uh, that shows what a, what a man that Mr. Peterson really was like uh, deep down, uh, made a comment uh, to my father about uh, uh, having you know, rough times and uh, Christmas Eve there was a knock at the door and he stepped out uh, side to, to see who was at the door and here was a Christmas basket with a turkey just in time and, and of course other, other articles in there food just in time to see a Peterson's ice cream truck go around the, the corner in spite of the downturn in the textile industry, Almont was still more or less the same self-contained blue-collar town it had been for the previous 130 years. It seemed to me at that point in time there were more uh, uh, Almont supplying more things to the, the city than uh, uh, people drawing from, from the city uh, for it. For instance, the flour mill. Um, a lot of the flour went to Morris Lamotte's in, in Ottawa. Flour mill was quite a, a going concern and employed not only people who worked in the flour mill, but there was also the trucking business that went back and forth, which uh, uh, was pretty well dominated, I think, by the Stuarts and also uh, the Thurstons. 
and uh, and of course both of those were also involved in in hauling milk from producers dairy which was right, right across the street from the flour mill and uh, of course the milk was brought into Elmont and then taken to uh, uh, producers dairy and then uh, partially processed here and then taken into Ottawa and processed there uh, Johnny Erskine's Elmont Food Store, part of the IGA chain, was the anchor of a bustling downtown area. So the first business, uh, I bought the land and building from Johnny Erskine and Norman Hutt and Howard Bowl in 1975, I believe, and uh, it uh, was called Elmont IGA, and when I came in, it was all wooden shells and the cash registers that had 1 to 10, a series of 1 to 10, so, and uh, the cigarettes were just in, in little cubicles above, there were no belts in the cash register, it was all, all, everything was very manual. Not, not too far removed from the Stone Age. Yeah, Friday night was shopping night back in those days, and you couldn't get a parking spot in the main street. The street would be full of people walking up and down with their kids shopping. It was a whole different way of life to what it is today. We had McCormick's, we had Johnson's, we, uh, everything was at our fingertips. We had two um, drug stores. I remember Mr. Snedden down at the bottom of the street and he made the best milkshakes and sodas going and we used to often go there for a milkshake or a soda and we would call him Snifty. Don't ask me why, but he was Snifty. And then we would go to the Superior after school um, for a cherry Coke. Go up the main street, uh, places like the uh Peterson's ice cream it was just a cornerstone of the uh, of the community. The old Almont Gazette, and uh, back in those days, the uh, the local editor had a lot of a uh, lot of influence in the uh, in the life of the community. We opened the uh, store, uh, got in stock as soon as we could to uh, increase the stock, and. Uh, it was a great thing for us. The people from that worked in the mills were great to uh, support us, and they would come in and they would lay it on the line. Now, we're not going to be paying cash for this. We have to buy it on time, and we'll be in every payday and pay. Well, that just worked out perfect for us, and uh, they didn't pay any interest in those days, and uh, Everybody paid uh, as they said they would, and it was just a wonderful start for, for us. You know, your downtown, it, it, it did. It had everything that, that we needed, and uh, it obviously was the, 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 the hub of business then, and uh, exciting. It was an exciting town. It was a town, uh, Christmas time, uh, you'd, you'd, you'd be down street and the stores were lit up and they were beautiful, you know, they were beautiful. There were several other businesses scattered throughout the town. The lumber business was located on Farm Street. It was started by my grandfather, William Watchorn, in 1926. And it operated from 1926 until 1966. My father took it over after my grandfather and he operated it for quite a number of years. And in the last six to eight years, I operated it. We got into the uh, construction business as well. My father and two other uh, gentlemen started a, a firm called Valley Homes. And we had quite a number of men, and we were building houses in Almont, Carlton Place, Smith Falls, Carp, all around the area. A lot of people probably don't realize is that in Almont, we used to have quite a few car dealers. We used to have, uh, across from the Legion, there used to be um, uh, Hills General Motors dealership, which became Burns Pontiac. I actually was overseas with a, a fellow that ended up a, a high-level position in Oshawa with General Motors. And I went straight to him and, and got, got our, list, our name on the list to become a dealers out of Almont. Or we may not have had a Almond dealer as a GM dealer. Oh, in our dealership, we had ourselves and uh, 
Of course, there's the Burns family from Pembroke moved our way, and they amalgamated with us. It eventually ended up calling the dealership at one time Burns Pontiac. We seem to keep the uh, dealerships that we farmed alive and going for, you know, 20 years. Mobility was still limited in the early part of the decade. I moved here, I moved, uh, went to uh, Church Street School, and at Church Street School I was in, in grade five, and it, it uh, really blew me away that a couple of the kids in my class had never been to Ottawa. We would go to the Ottawa exhibition, that was quite a thrill. Um, but other than that, we didn't travel to the city. I do remember, though, traveling by car with my dad, and I do remember when we would come back down Highway 44, and of course, that was in the old days, and if you remember the big hill at Dwyer Hill, which has was shaved, it used to be much, much steeper than it is today. I remember so often that we weren't quite able to make that hill on the first try, and my father would have to back up and, you know, give another try, and up we went finally. But that was a long trip from, from Ottawa to Almont. That was a day's outing. Of necessity, entertainment was generally local, and much of that was self-made. We swam at the flume. Uh, we learned to dive there, we learned to swim, look after somebody, um, count and make sure everybody came up, and uh, got along with all different ages, because there would be people 12 years old just learning to swim, and there'd be young men in their early 30s cooling off at, after work. In those days, the mills were still running, and so after 4 o'clock, a lot of the uh, young men would go for a, a cool swim before they'd go home. And there was always a uh, collection of shorts, usually Elmont High School shorts. Uh, and so if you didn't have a bathing suit, you just borrow a pair of shorts, and when you were finished, changed in the bushes, left the shorts there for the next person. The little guys, uh, like I was back then, uh, would go to the beach. They had uh, lifeguards there, they had change rooms, uh, and uh, they had uh, floating uh, rafts out there where you, you could go, and they had the boy, boy lines there. And uh, they had people to uh, actually uh, teach you how to swim, and uh, you could get your junior red cross. I just remember going to a movie and seeing the feature that we were paying to see. It took so long because we would have... Um, First of all, we would have the um, invitation to eat the popcorn and drink the pop, and then we would have the newsreel, and then we would have the cartoons, and finally we would get to the main feature, that which we were planning to attend. Rooney's Pool Hall. None of us were supposed to be there, but that was the, uh, that was the collection spot for the, uh, where you met people and plans developed from there, as complicated as they were. I, I can't recall what the issue of, but uh, probably uh, if you weren't very good, you might lose a few, uh, few quarters, I suppose, on the game, but uh, not likely anything other than perhaps our parents didn't want us to be in the pool hall and maybe thought we should be home studying, perhaps. <laughs> The dances we look forward to, for for example, uh, we had them at the town hall there when uh, the hospital dance was held at the town hall there, and then it was held out at the uh, agricultural hall, and those were great uh, suppers and dances. We had different themes of the hospital dance. Once it was a Hawaiian theme, and then everything was decorated Hawaiian style, and then there was uh, country western and once it was a Bavarian and we had balconies with flowers on it and it, it was very much the affair in Elmont at the time. It was an occasion once a year to really get dressed up. The men all wore dark suits and, and the ladies wore long dresses and it was a lovely affair. 
Because Elmont was still very much self-sufficient, it was also archaic in many ways. Some of these anachronisms were charming and quaint. Where else could you go to a town and have a, a, a car driving around with two big speakers on it, <laughs> making announcements and playing music? <laughs> Charlie Vinner, oh my gosh. Oh, in the 60s, the town was slow. The, uh, we, we had the, uh, the horse-drawn uh, milk wagons, Bob Young and, uh, from Strathburn Dairy. I can remember Bob, he'd park his, uh, his horse at the house and uh, he'd go through the backyard and the horse would go around to the next street and stop at the next house. We, uh, the, the kids used to like to see Bob coming because uh, we used to take chocolate milk off his wagon and we figured out Bob always used to put a crate of chocolate milk in his wagon so the kids could get it and not touch the, the white milk. Um, the milkman would come to the door every day or every other day, and we had glass bottles back then, and we would just write our order, uh, what we wanted, and the, the milkman would deliver our bottle and leave it between the doors. Um, and I always remember that the milk had a little cardboard top, and uh, especially, I uh, will remember the the cream that always sat at the top of the bottle. And that was really precious to have that cream. So we would skim the cream and put it in another bottle and then we would continue. But changes were underway. In 1962, the clip-clop of horses hooves in the streets of Elmont was heard for the last time as Metcalf's Dairy put the last horse-drawn milk wagon out to pasture. The 1960s also saw changes in the practice of medicine. My husband had a partner, Dr. Schulder, and the two of them were the only doctors in town at the time. They worked very, very hard. They did the hospital work in the morning, and then all afternoon was, was office hours, and people just came in, and when they came in, I'd write their name down on, the, on a sheet of paper, and, and uh, uh, then they were called in as their turn came up. Um, they worked evenings then from 7 till 9 for people who worked in the city. Uh, and again, it was, you know, as you walk in. All the emergencies came to the office at that time. They didn't go to the emergency room unless it was a serious car accident or, or uh, heart attacks, you know, something, something like that. But any cuts and, and uh, uh, just, you know, uh, I don't know whether you'd call them minor or not, but... Uh, uh, would come in and, and we'd do the work on them there. Dr. Bach, uh, I believe, as I recall, I think he's the first one who spoke to me when I came to town. Yeah. And uh, came across as a warm person, very welcoming. He liked to have fun, but he was very, uh, he was always proper and always uh, distinguished, nice, nice gentleman. I had a great deal of respect for him. Dr. King is a character. Um, he was also a very nice gentleman. He was very, he was always very accommodating. And uh, I, I know I could call him like if I was on call in the middle of the night and there was a patient in the hospital. I remember on one particular instance, this lady who was a patient of his worried me. Uh, and I called him and he came. He would also say, oh, we always put his shirt and tie when he came, even if it was 2 o'clock in the morning. And uh, actually, Dr. Bach would do that as well. Uh, shirt and tie. 2 o'clock in the morning, shirt and tie. And uh, uh, reassured, reassured me that the patient was okay. He knew the patient, and she was a little bit uh, dramatic at times. And... Uh, and then he would go on into another story and another story. And uh, I remember thinking, it's awfully nice of Dr. King to come and help me out. But I know I'm going to have to settle for a long story afterwards. Because <laughs> he loved talking. And it wasn't always related. <laughs> oh, boy. The venerable but outdated Rosamond Memorial Hospital was still in use at the beginning of the decade. 
In 1961, healthcare in Elmont took a significant step forward as a brand new 41 bed modern facility was opened. Patients were moved to the new hospital by ambulances supplied by John Carey and Murray Comba. When we started here, uh, we automatically, because of the funeral home, we were expected to have an ambulance service available as well, which we did. And uh, our ambulance certainly wasn't of the caliber of amb ambulance you see today with being able to stand up in them and uh, all the lights on and all of this type of thing. We uh, bought a seven-passenger used Chrysler car from Hawkesbury and converted it into an ambulance and uh, it did us very well for a number of years. And then I forget the exact year that the Ontario government forced the issue that there would be proper ambulances and staffed. A major benefit of the larger and improved facilities was an increase in the range of surgeries that could be performed. They said fractures was never sent away. Uh, they did DNCs, they did uh, tonsillectomies, appendectomies, and then they had surgeons from Ottawa coming out. One surgeon especially, Dr. Jack Clark, he became a fixed chain element. He came and did bigger ones like gallstones and, and whatever else was to do. He, he came, did the surgery, and the local doctors looked after it afterwards. But Dr. Clark was the surgeon in Elmont for many years. During the first half of the decade, those quirky one, two, and three-digit phone numbers were still in use, as Elmont's telephone system continued to be based on the operator-assisted switchboard system. There were some advantages to that. I do recall uh, before June went to Queen's University and uh, uh, you had to go through, I always phoned her and on a Friday night. We'd have to go, and I always phoned from the uh, pay station down at the pay phone down at the pool hall. But the uh, Bell Canada switchboard was across the street. That's where the, uh, and they had the uh, operators there. Well, whenever I phoned the number for Queens, I knew the operator, and, uh, and many nights I got free phone calls to, uh, to Kingston. It was, uh, they knew who was calling, who. <laughs> who I was calling, and, uh, um, and that operator, we were friends for many years. She's since passed away, but it was, uh, there was often free phone calls to Queen's University on the weekends. So. We used to be on party lines, too. When you'd pick up the phone, if you heard somebody talking, you either listened to or you put the phone down immediately. And if you didn't put the phone down immediately, then they would tell you to do that, you know. So a uh, whole different world from what it is now. By 1966, there were 1,500 local Bell customers. Inevitably, they were about to enter the digital age. Oh, my mother uh, probably started in about 1942. And then the, um, we switched to dial in 1966, I believe. So all those years, she was, she was involved with, with the Bell Company. This is the log book. It's been around for a very long time. It was the log book that sat in the telephone office. And at the end of the day, or at the end of the shift, the telephone operator, or a telephone operator, um, had to fill in anything eventful that might have happened um, during that day. On March the 6th, 1966, was when the telephone office um, switched to dial and my mother um, had written the last notation in the book March the 6th 1966 midnight Elmont cut over to dial the office was filled with spectators the 60s were not without their difficulties a particularly horrific event happened in May of 1965. There was a fire in Irish Town where four children died. Um, and uh, because there was no um, 
fire hydrants in Irish Town. There was no water service in Irish Town, water or sewage. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't think there's ever been that set. People felt that that was the case, but I, I don't think... We didn't go into inquiries and all that kind of thing like we do now. Um, certainly we had a volunteer fire department that was absolutely super. Um, so that everything was done that could be done, but it was there was a loss of life there too. That house really, no one should have been living in it. It was, it was needing to be demolished. Uh, if those people wanted water, there was a hose that was connected to Comba School, and they went there to get their water in the summertime, but in the wintertime, that hose was disconnected and they had to go to the old water tank, if you remember where that was, down by Main Street. And this is where they got their water. There were no sewer, there were outside toilets. Uh, and while I was here uh, in Elmont, I had been invited by Mrs. Napier because we had a group of people up on, on a hill there, to a meeting at her house. And at that meeting, she showed me a bathroom, a full bathroom, tub, toilet, sink, which she had built in the house, but could not connect because there was no water service. And I thought this was a tragedy when I put it together with these two young girls dying. Coming back to the textile industry, the writing was clearly on the wall. Got a job in the dye house as, as a lab technician. So I, I worked there for uh, six, seven months, I guess, and then uh, colleagues called me up because they needed a, an assistant to their lab technician, so they hired me over there. But I saw I wasn't going anywhere, so uh, after that I uh, applied for a job with the government and. Uh, took a cut and pay to go to the government. I was making $35 a week over there. I went to the government for $30 a week back then, which was not much money, but it was good money at, at the time. Another blow to the local textile industry happened in a dramatic fashion, as 75 people lost their jobs when the Collie Woolen Mill on Mill Street succumbed to flames. The empty site would later become the location of the new post office. The mills were, were running or they just shut down. One by one they shut down, so people started to move out of town to get jobs and that. And uh, it sort of changed the whole aspect of the town. When the mills dried up, as they say, Almont lost three quarters of its uh, support and life employment abilities. You had to work depend on just individual outlets like our own, our, our little dealership and stuff like that, where you had six or eight or ten people, whereas before you had 30 and 40 on the list. It was a hurting time. If it hadn't been for the woolen mills, I don't think Almont would exist or would have existed. Uh, it was the woolen mills that made Elmont, and then when the woolen mills died, Elmont was in trouble. The once proud little Manchester of Canada had lost its identity and had become just another bedroom community on the outskirts of a big city. The blue collars had been replaced by pajama collars. By the end of the 60s, many people had turned to the city for their shopping and entertainment. On their way home from work, the wife would meet with the husband if they weren't coming on the same car. They would go in and they would do their buying uh, in the stores in the city and then stay for supper, say, and then come home. This had a significant impact on Elmont. One was the loss of the beloved O'Brien Theatre, which had been struggling for the past few years in a vain attempt to compete with the larger theatres in the city. The screen faded to black for the last time in 1969. Two years later, the Royal Bank would move into the building. That same year, passenger service on the trains also came to an end. The Elmont of Daniel Shipman and Bennett Rosamond was gone forever. As the 70s dawned, the town took an emotional hit.
as both the curling rink and the arena were lost. The curling rink was destroyed by fire in March of 1970, and the arena was condemned in December because of problems with beams supporting the roof. In 1972, the town council would approve a phased-in approach to building a new facility that would eventually contain a skating surface, a curling rink and lounge, and an assembly hall. The first stage, the skating surface, was officially opened on August 5th the following year. The ice surface used the undersized pad of the original 1940s arena. It would later be upgraded to a full regulation 200 by 85 feet. The town's troubles were far from over. Almont Dairy Products was sold to a company from Brockville. The plant was partially demolished and reduced to nothing more than a milk-receiving depot, putting more people out of work. In 1975, the bad news continued as Zephyr Textiles shut down their carpet-spinning operation, putting another 100 people out of work. Many people were unemployed, and many of them were living in poverty. And as a result, in 1974, a new institution was born that will prove to be beneficial to the community until the present day. Many years ago, when the hub began, it was raising money for CHEO. When that got built, the focus of the hub became more Mississippi Mills and area. Julia Thomas was the ringleader for this, and, and uh, her husband said to her, well, what are you going to do now? And so we got together, and at that time, I was involved with the Neighbourhood Club, and the Neighbourhood Club was a group of women from Irish town, who were poor, and I was involved with them through the United Church. And with the support of a woman named Gail Thompson, she helped these women meet on a regular basis. So when we were getting together and thinking about what we could do for our own community, as opposed to raising funds for a children's hospital, um, I suggested a thrift shop. And everybody thought that was a great idea. And um, Cliff Graham had a drugstore on the main street of Elmont, and Peter and I said we would buy the store and rent it to the group, and that's what we did. So we rented it for a low amount, and we opened that store in short order. And that uh, place was hugely successful right from the word go. We were able to, the Civitans gave us $250, and we were able to pay it back the first month. Everything in our store is donated, so our, our stock is here because of the generosity of the community. People buy things and their purchases then, the money they have paid then gets returned to the community. So it's this wonderful circle, just like the wheel, just like the hub, going round and round. So everything is returned to the community. Uh, last year we gave $54,000 back. This year it's going to be closer to 60000 And those donations go to groups, um, students, children, seniors. We have a sponsorship in on the Mills bus, for instance. We uh, give donations to people going into town, into Ottawa for cancer treatments. We help people who have a fire. We help send kids to things like Reach for the Top. Um, all kinds of things get helped through the hub. Rebound is part of the hub. It's just that they're in a different space. <laughs> so if we had room here for Rebound, Rebound would be right here. We, we outgrew it. And they have the town's e-waste site. So if you have old computers, printers, electronic gear of any kind that you need to be rid of, you can take it to Rebound. And the beauty of that is that we get paid for doing that service. So uh, that's a bit more money that we're able to put back out to our community. It was Julia that said, what we need here is a hospice. And as we speak, and this, this being November 2013, that hospice is up and running. It's a volunteer visitor service. We have a paid coordinator. We have a board. We have established ourselves as a corporation. And um, we're a going concern. 
The Hub will be celebrating its 40th anniversary in 2014. During the 70s, the municipality itself was facing financial difficulties caused by a significant erosion of its industrial tax base. This was exacerbated by the fact that the town was in desperate need of infrastructure upgrade. As a result, the province had put a development freeze on the town. And it had been put on by the province because of the water and sewer situation and the... Um, we were having to broken water mains that you'd have to boil water and that kind of thing. So it was only the province that could lift it. So we started meeting with uh, whoever we could meet from the province. And they began to tell us what we had to do to get this freeze lifted. Initially, they just said, we we're going to give you a small number of, of units that you could have built for development purposes. But you have to be doing certain things and they the lagoon, of course, was one of the problems, the phosphorus that was going into the river and so mm -hmm. forth. That had to be cleaned up. Well, that was a long process. It went on all the time that we were, practically all the time that we were on the three three councils. And uh, so that was, that was one of the things. And, of course, the water mains had to be upgraded. And uh, all this took money so that um, taxes went up. <laughs> I have the number 15%, but it sounds terrible. <laughs> I mean, that would be enough to get you shot, I think, at this point. In 1975, there was some movement on the infrastructure side. Three streets in Irishtown finally got water and sewer services. Irishtown, the main street, approving subdivisions, and Gale subdivision was one of them back then. Springdale, like that was back when the town's really started to grow. And all the old houses, again, were, as we mentioned before, were being fixed up. So there was no section of town that, you know, looked shabby type of thing. It was, everything was looking good. And the town was growing. The sad part of it is we were losing industry. Was, you know, we lost the plants. Uh, we, you know, we lost Zephyr Textiles. We lost the truck company. We lost the brush factory. Like, but that's basically because we don't like to admit it, especially Elmont people who were born here. But you're on an island. You know, you don't have any main highway here. We don't even have a highway now, to be quite honest. Yeah. They're all county roads. But back then you had two highways. But you still did not have a main highway. You had 17 here and you had seven down there. Armbrad grew. Carlton Place grew because they're on main highways, you see. We didn't grow that way. But 1977 also saw the opening of the $1.5 million, 104-bed Fairview Manor. That same year, a group of citizens saw the need for affordable housing in the town and formed a non-profit organization called the Elmont Community Development Corporation. The ACDC, with help from the Ontario Ministry of Housing, CMHC, and the Elmont Town Council, opened 12 affordable housing units for low-income families in Irish Town. This would prove to be the first of many such projects for this group. The aim was to provide housing locally, and an apartment building was, was needed at the time. And uh, it, it was quite a, quite a learning procedure for everyone on, on the board. We hadn't uh, done that sort of thing before, and yet it's amazing. You, you have a job to do, and you just plow in, and you make mistakes, but anyway, you pick yourself up and you go again. And uh, the first time around, uh, the apartment building that, that we envisioned uh, was going to be built on the co-op site. For whatever reason, that, uh, that fell through, and uh, we were sued, as a matter of fact, for $60,000, which really, uh, I guess, we're still paying off today. But we kept going, and the uh, building was then erected on Country Street. Uh, the need for a second building was obvious, and uh, it was hoped to build that in just a couple of years, but that didn't happen. There was one stumbling block after another. But, uh, however, it was finally built and very, very nice. And uh, it opened uh, a year ago 
Town and Country Phase Mm 2. And I think uh, plans are underway for Phase 3. Elmont lost another link to the past when the iconic train station was demolished in 1978. The Collie Woolen Company had purchased the deserted Rosamond Mill vacated by Zephyr Textiles the year before. 1980 was a year of beginnings as the town could be said to be picking up momentum. The new Elizabeth Kelly Library, named for the woman who was synonymous with the word library in Elmont from 1939 until 1976, was built in the footprint of the train station. It was a significant step up from the cramped basement quarters in the town hall. The library has undergone considerable changes since then and has an interesting future ahead. I remember very early on going to the library in Elmont when it was upstairs in the town hall, run by Miss Miss Elizabeth Kelly, and it was a very quiet place. And shh was heard a lot in the library, and if we were not quiet, we were told to leave. Um, We've had patrons come in and say, you know, I've just moved here, I find your library so welcoming and refreshing and I love that we don't have to tiptoe around and be quiet and keep our children from, you know, having a good time. And I started working when the library was in the old town hall. We had books, adult and children's, we had magazines and newspapers, and I think that was it. Yeah, that was probably it. Our collection at the moment includes approximately 60,000 items. So that includes books for adults and children. We have um, reference material and um, books on CD, music CDs, DVDs, which are um, documentaries and feature films. We have computers just set up for children that um, is literacy-based games that they can play, and children, it's great. We do get books that are damaged, and sometimes beyond repair. A lot of the times, it this is true, we, it, most often it's books on training dogs that come back in a brown paper bag in pieces because their dog has eaten them. This is, that's true. <laughs> I would see Future Directions being a a computer technology lab, much more technical assistance for um, uh, community members. So having um, a tech support to guide you on your iPad, on your smartphone, on your um, laptop, and all those kinds of medias and technologies, and and also providing wireless printing, um, working uh, within the cloud so that people could do their work from home and then transfer it to the library to be printed. Um, I would also see the library as being a, a, a really vital community hub, a place for people to meet, to have conversations, to, um, uh, to make access to the space in a variety of different ways. So, for example, still wanting to have a quiet place to work and study, but also have a meeting room where you could be more social. In a foreshadowing of the Elmont of the future, a series of classical concerts held initially in private homes would begin in 1980, and Elmont in Concert was born. It was immediately successful, and the concerts would soon go on to be held in the Ron Karen Auditorium in the Elmont Old Town Hall. The concert has boasted performances by artists from all over the world, drawn to Almont in part because of the amazing acoustics of the hall. What I know coming here and having read a little bit as well in the newspaper today, um, there are people who have sung in choirs all, all their lives here in Almont, so I'm sure there's, a, there's a, an appreciative audience here. Uh, that bring as well the arts to to the town and um, you know have a great um, uh, series here. Um, the hall itself, I'm sure you will take some more uh, images of the hall itself, has really a great acoustic and it is due to certain factors, one being that it's, it's wood, so wood is really great 
uh, a material when you perform wooden floor, wooden ceiling, a perfect size. It's not too big, it's not too small. And as well for the audience, I mean, to see the choir or the performers up on stage here is a great, great space to perform in. About to enter its 34th year, the series is stronger than ever. Another institution that has turned into something truly magnificent had its humble beginning also in 1980. A number of local historians believed that it was imperative to preserve the legacy of the textile industry in Elmont and the surrounding areas. And so began the Mississippi Valley Textile Museum. I got involved and we formed a, a textile committee, textile museum committee, and it I got a few, a few people interested in it, and um, we went to the town and uh, said we wanted their support in trying to form a, a museum, and they, uh, I put a motion forward, and I, they surprised me by passing it. They didn't know what they were getting themselves into, I guess, but anyway, it, that, that was uh, that's years ago, of course, and it took many, many years uh, to make something of it. The Textile Association gave us our first big grant, five thousand dollars. So, at any rate, that was used in the early days to just try to get things going, which we started as a visitor center in the old post office. That's right, yeah. And uh, we went from there across the street to a storefront. We stayed there for seven, six or seven years. After eight years in cramped quarters on Mill Street, the Mississippi Valley Textile Museum moved in 1991 to its permanent location in the annex to the former Rosamond No. 1 Mill. The building was, you know, a wreck. Eh? Yeah. We, roof was leaking. Windows had to be fixed. Mm -hmm. We had to spend $10,000 just to open and close the doors. <coughs> so, there was no heat. They cut it all off from the mill. Right. And uh, I always remember the first winter or two, they, they crouched in that office with a little electric heater. Yes. As you can see, we went on and on and on and kept at it and raised a little money here and a little money there. I brought in the Lions Club to help us start a the lamb races on the river oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, made a few dollars, but the most important thing it did, it brought the town down to the river and they began to get interested in it. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, it was in the backyard and they threw the junk out that way. Then the next group of people came in and they were people who could get grants, who could do this. And it, we seemed to have attracted the right people at the right time. I mean, getting Michael, was an absolute godsend because we've gone from it, we're still at the struggle stage but we've gone from a building that had no air conditioning or heating to heating air conditioned it's been a huge thing and i think this will happen the the, the people that are needed seem to arrive at the right time it's magical mm -hmm. First time at Fiberfest, and I'm blown away by these murals. It's they're so beautiful. I'm an artist, and I'm like getting lost in all the colors, and I just can't get enough of it. It's gorgeous. A few years later, the museum launched Fiberfest, and it grew to the size that it had to be held simultaneously at the museum and the community center. It is still successfully growing in 2013. One of the big things I really want to see with this organization is to really see it fill the town. Whether it be interpretation exhibitions throughout the town uh, that become part of the Riverwalk, that become part of the different parks where um, uh, the power company is. To me, the biggest and most unique part of our community is the textile industry. And that's what makes this community stand out. And to me, there's so much that needs to be done to, to, to really understand what that life was like and what it was like working in a mill and what the mill workers' lives were like. So that's one area. Another is bringing in some really top-notch international exhibitions and programming. Um, working with guest curators to come in from guest curators of Canadian curators, could be international curators, coming in and, and presenting 
different views and different things about the textile industry. With the intent of bringing in new industry, the town of Almont purchased 91 acres on the east end of town. 32 years later, in 2013, and in spite of many proposals by various entrepreneurs, most of the site still sits empty. Almont was schizophrenic, and it may still be uh, schizophrenic. Almont, at that time, wanted industry, but it wanted clean industry. Uh, and then again, it didn't want industry because it liked the town the way it was. Uh, the town was a nice town uh, at that time. And it, Almont folk were generally happy at that time. Uh, and they would like to have had more industry in order to get a bigger tax base, but they were afraid of what that industry would bring to the town. It's okay for Carlton Place to become industrial, but we don't want Almont to change that much. Uh, and so we had a struggle getting an industrial park. To get somebody to come in and set up an industrial type business, no, you don't have the services for them. I remember when I first come on town council, we'd have people come in from Germany all over the world and, you know, we want to settle here. As soon as they found out that you're on well water and lagoon system, uh, they weren't too interested. We're still on well water. Now we got a sewage plant, but now we're not on a highway. You know, it's, it's not going to happen. It would be nice because we did the, the industrial tax base. Welcome to the 30th Annual North Lantern Island Games. Wow. 1983 witnessed the start of another festival that is still thriving 30 years later, the North Lanark Highland Games. Oh, it's one of the better yeah, days in Ontario. day like today, it's yeah. a beauty. You got the Grand Sands here, you got people on either sides, the river. You really can't beat it in terms of scenery in Ontario. In March of 1984, fire struck at the Collie Mill. This would represent the final death knell for the textile industry in Elmont. A once glorious era came to an inglorious end. Developer Richard Burkhart presented plans to the town council for turning the empty Rosamond No. 1 mill into condominiums. On the strength of 24 units being pre-sold, Council gives the project, now called Millfall, the go-ahead. If he hadn't come in when he came in, within seven years that building would have been a pile of stones. November 4, 1987 saw the demise of the very last mill of any description in Almont as Maple Leaf Mills closed the flour mill. For the first time in 166 years, Almont was without an operating mill of any kind. Excitement reigned in the summer of 1987 as Mill Street was transformed into a movie set. The first movie that most people would remember, the uh, Le Port Tournant, The Revolving Door, uh, was brought to town partly because my niece uh, had taken a course uh, at the University of Montreal, I believe it was, and became uh, aware that they were, people were looking for this certain type of town. Almont, as you know, has a very distinctive uh, downtown. 
uh, and uh, relatively untouched um, by modernist architecture. So when they scouted, they said, that's it. That's, that's an absolutely beautiful town. Since that time, Hollywood has discovered the beauty of Elmont, and several other movies have been shot here. One was called The House Sitter, starring Tori Spelling and her husband, Dean McDermott. Parts of both films were shot in the Glen, the home of Bernard and Catherine Cameron. It offers an element of privacy off the uh, beaten path as it is. It is. Um, and so we were able to provide that, that seclusion, that uh, um, the space not only within the house but around the house so they could set up um, do their business, which it is for them, it's a business, uh, without a lot of interruptions. The production companies uh, love the cooperation that they get from the people and the town itself. Uh, and the, uh, the actors and actresses are really blown away by how nice the community is. History is made in 1988 as Elmont gets its first and only female mayor. We had the first, the first um, election in 88. Uh, we had the party here that, uh, that night, and uh, all the councillors had come in, of course, and uh, we had all our friends and so forth, and uh, it was really nice. I, you know, I always say when I go into a new group, don't be subtle. I do not get subtleties. Be straightforward, tell me exactly what you mean, and we'll work out whatever it is. But I, I really, I, I, and, and I'm being perfectly truthful, that if you're being subtle, I probably, I'm not going to get it. <laughs> the town received a Winterio grant of $396,000 to help pay for the building of a new curling rink, which would be part of the community center complex. It was completed in the fall of the following year. 1990 ushered in another transition that resulted in significant changes to the downtown area as Gord Pike moved his grocery store out to the business park, which put a new face on the eastern entrance to the town. I think Gordy Pike was one of the best things that happened to Elmont uh, in terms of its evolution and its development. Uh, um, he was willing to take chances. We, we had a, a town hall meeting and uh, I was making a presentation to uh, the business people in town and this was probably 1988, 1987 and, uh, I, and the, the, the hall was absolutely packed where the, the council chambers were, the old, the old town hall and there were, there were businesses that were flowing out into the hall and there was a room in back and the place was absolutely jam-packed with councillors, the mayor and business people and everything else and uh, so I made my presentation to the group and it wasn't a surprise, they knew what I wanted to do and uh, I said to them that you know I'd like to move the grocery store from downtown to the edge of town and there was a hue and cry that you know, what's going to happen to the downtown and it won't be the same and this and that. <clears throat> and I, I, I said to everybody there, I said, you have two choices. I said, I can, I can move from, or I can stay downtown and, and someone else would move in and put a grocery store at the edge of town because it's inevitable. Or I can own my building downtown and build a new grocery store at the edge of town. So you've got one person that has an interest in the grocery store at the edge of town, but still has a major interest in the downtown. After 65 years on downtown Mill Street, Lee Pro Hardware also made the move to a new building in the industrial park. Parking was an issue. What they wanted to do was pull up in front of your business, run in, get their product, run out and get home, get the job done. We had researched doing some renovations down there, ex expanding where we could, but we were so limited that uh, that's when we made our executive decision to build a new store. Levi Home Hardware moved into the site of the former IGA on Mill Street in 1992. 
I know when uh, the bottom half of Mill Street was pretty well vacant when uh, the IGA moved out to the outskirts, sort of started some of that outskirts move, and uh, and we eventually bought it, fixed it up, and you know started a little hub again, and uh, uh, you know we were there for 12 years or so, and. Uh, Elmont was about to lose another icon as the 90-foot cylindrical water tower perched in its spot at the upper end of Ottawa Street for decades watched its replacement being built. The new tower would continue to show the slogan, Elmont the Friendly Town, until 2013. Then, as a result of being reduced to a ward of the amalgamated community of Mississippi Mills, the slogan would similarly be reduced to Friendly Almont. The transition of Almont into being renowned for its festivals and concerts was well underway by 1993. Light Up the Night was just three years old when it boasted an audience of 6,000 people that filled up Mill Street. It's pretty unique, you know, in a, in a town like this. You close off the, the main street and, and thousands of people come. It seems like the whole town's here and, and, and many more as well. Um, Hydro has always been involved in, in the setup and, uh, and uh, organization of it. Um, my first year uh, with Mississippi River Power, uh, Dan came to me and said, uh, can you come and help us out with this Light Up the Night uh, committee thing? I said, sure. And, uh, sure. and next thing I knew, I was the chairman of the committee. <laughs> and being up on the stage, it's just you can't believe how many people are on that street. It's, uh, it's just packed full and, you know, the from kids to uh, elderly people to uh, just to, and so many faces you don't recognize. There's uh, one year they the host at Wayne Rostad asked you know how many people are here from out of town and you'd swear at least uh, at least half of the people put up their hand and um, every year we get comments from people from out of town saying what a, how lucky we are to have the event and um, in the past couple of years it's funny there's been people who have from town who have brought friends to the event from out of town and they loved it so much and loved seeing the town that they've moved here. Following in the footsteps of Richard Burkhart, Greg Smith and Stephen Brathwaite purchased the Victorian Woolen Mill with an eye to converting it to a combination of commercial and office spaces. All these buildings were sitting here empty. Nobody, nobody wanted to take them on, nobody really knew what to do with them. So. Anyway, we kind of looked at each other across the table and the next day we got in touch with each other and we started talking and the next thing we both knew, we'd put in an offer to buy this building. So we bought it. Um, it had been empty for a number of years. Uh, there was no significant electrical or plumbing in the building, very, very minimal. I think there was one toilet on the second or third floor, if I remember. Um, and it was very rough. It was, essentially, it was a shell. They came to council with, with, with great ideas, like uh, I think they, they first worked on, um, we used to call it the old shoddy mill, the one down the corner. And when they brought in the thing and, and, and their plans and that, it looked great, you know, and uh, council had no hesitation to uh, to give them all the assistance that, uh, that they needed. And uh, it's paid off for us, you know, they, instead of a... An old derelict building sitting down there. We've got a, a beautiful restaurant and with condominiums and what, and the same thing with the old Thor, uh, Thorburn Mill. They came in. They were well prepared. They came in with their plans. They showed us what they were going to do, and uh, again, council backed them on that because better than having a a, a, a derelict building sitting there. And uh, they were willing to put the money into it and fix it, and and it's been a boom. It's been an asset to the town. Got the first unit with the restaurant up and going in 1995. We were looking for houses, and uh, I can't remember why Stephanie and I were on this little adventure together. And she said, Dad, if you can get a really good coffee, you know, like you like those, those ones with the foam on top, and, and if I can get a real French croissant, then, um, you know, then we should stay. So we walked uh, the main street, and at the bottom of the street, uh, the Victoria Mill really had only one space that was developed. There was, where now the Heirloom Cafe was, was another um, uh, very nice restaurant. And uh, the rest of the building was abandoned. Um, you know, it was, it was still in, in dire need of, of reconstruction and redevelopment. 
But we walked into the bottom, found this cozy little restaurant in a stone mill, and um, uh, I asked for a, a latte, got one. And, uh, and then Stephanie looked around and said, croissants, look at under that glass, real French croissants. So we decided we'd stay. But that kick-started uh, an interest in the downtown, and then there were other people that wanted to do the same thing. And I was lucky to become a kind of thread between different partnerships. And, and if these gentlemen didn't come in when they come in, this town would have been almost a ghost town. you got to say thanks to those people. Peterson's ice cream was sold to a company named Glencoe Manufacturing. The plant was shut down and only the ice cream bar at the front was left open. They served ice cream made by another company in Peterborough. Yet another Elmont legacy had faded away. Art in the Attic joined the growing list of festivals in 1996. There's an evolution of how people's art changes, how their personalities change, and how they grow, and, and everybody's excited for everybody else. It's not, a, it's not that individual a thing, it's like a community event, and people watch year after year how someone is changing their style, or, and it gives people ability to um, communicate about that, and, and it's just a wonderful atmosphere. Well, my name is Margaret Denis, and I'm one of the artists that is in the student section of the Art in the Attic show. Everything in this section is by students, and it also spans from grade 9 to grade 12, so we have, and the curriculum changes every year, so we have a lot of variety in this section. Mm. This is my dog, Katie. Uh, it's done in charcoal. It's, the community really emphasizes and supports the arts a lot, um, which is fantastic like really fantastic for an up-and-coming artist or someone who's even interested at all in the arts because there's just a lot to do and um, the new generation is looking quite hopeful I think uh, I know a few people who are going the, into the arts myself included so it's really great and the student section is, is a perfect example of all that even kids who weren't really even that interested in it before have produced some really fantastic work, so it's great to see. After six years in the new location in the industrial park, Lee Pro Hardware succumbed to the economy of the time. Here we go again. Another festival, Keltfest, was started in 1997. Better still, it was free. We thought we'd like to have some entertainment in this wonderful venue and we thought we'd like to have it free because uh, there are a lot of events where, where you had to pay to get in but this would give uh, some publicity to local talent and it would also give the general population an opportunity to come without an expenditure. Foreign skin dudes, belt buckles, belts, kilts, Glengarry's and Balmoros. All the regalia you can think of, anything you want, we've got it. The same year, the popular bread and butter bakery, soon to be given the nickname Baker Bob's, opened on Little Bridge Street. It's still a favorite in 2013. I, I didn't nickname myself Baker Bob's. I mean, that, that it didn't come, I never thought of it. It didn't come from me. We uh, had the name Bread and Butter because we wanted, to, we wanted to come up with a name that was um, kind of indicative of who we were and what we were doing. It was Bread and Butter Bakery and Fine Food because we were the bakery plus we had fine food. Um, but people kind of nicknamed me Baker Bob's and nicknamed the store Baker Bob's. Um, we didn't give into it right away. Uh, we only gave into it. When we decided to merge the bakery and the uh, bread and butter and the Almont Candy Company together into one retail entity, uh, we basically <laughs> said we give up. 
you know, and we called it Baker Bob's. And it's, oh, he's he got great reaction from him. We've had him for, I think, around 14 years or so. People see the puppet first, and if they don't know me or don't know the store, they'll be chatting with somebody at the cash and see the puppet. Then they'll look at him, and all of a sudden, their eyes will wander, and all of a sudden they see me, and then their eyes snap back to the puppet, and kind of, you see the, see the hands going, you know, pointing back and forth, and then I do a, you know, I do a wave up from the table and whatnot. People um, say, what is the best seller? We don't have a best seller. Um, we are, to some people, we are a cinnamon bun and a coffee. Uh, to other people, we're a cold drink and a sandwich. To other people, we're the, we're the place they get bread. Uh, we have people that come from Canada to get our date cookies. Our best seller probably isn't a commodity, an item. Our best seller is probably, we try to make it this way, is the experience. People choose to come to our store. They don't have to come here. There's nothing in here that you can't get somewhere else in town. So how do we, dif how do we differentiate ourselves? And hopefully we differentiate ourselves with the experience and, and with service. By you know, trying to make a difference in somebody's, in somebody's day. Maybe, you know, trying to make somebody laugh. Um, and if they happen to have a loaf of bread in their hand or a date cookie or a pie or a birthday cake, so be it. You know, so. In 1998, the town of Elmont experienced another transition as technically it ceased to exist. My name is Paul Finner. I was the first mayor of Mississippi Mills, 1998 to 2000. We were told that uh, in no uncertain terms of uh, with amalgamation that if you don't do it on your own, well, we, we, we may have to do it for you. And there was going to be a re reduction in grants. So, you know, yeah, uh, it's money that makes uh, these things work. And it'd be, so it was, uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, I guess we better get on with it. Money from um, the amalgamated community, we've built a fire hall, we've built a new library, we've repaired the arena, done roads, which they could never have done. Before amalgamation, I know that we had a million dollars in our reserve fund, and, uh, and now, of course, uh, we have a significant debt. Um, you know, countering that, uh, we we do have uh, Ottawa River Power, which uh, you know is a twenty million dollar project, and uh, and you know with with the orchestration of of that project, uh, assuming that it makes money, uh, it allows us to pay off the sewage treatment plant, which is a twenty eight million dollar project. So we've we've added. Uh, nearly $50 million worth of infrastructure that should stand us in very good stead for the future. Uh, could we have done that alone just as Almont? Uh, possibly, but, you know, I, I think uh, there's some good synergies with, with Mississippi Mills. Um, it, you know, it's, uh, it's a difficult question. You can always look back in in uh, retrospect and say, you know, would by amalgamation, did I reduce the total overall number of staff? Probably not. Probably uh, stayed the same or maybe even increased proportional to the, the population of the three areas. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a political football, that question. It's <laughs> and you lost the, the the personal feeling, and uh, and I think if you talk to the older people in, in any one of the, the three communities, they'll talk more about what they lost and what they gained. Yeah. And I personally think it was uh, probably the worst thing that happened to the town of Elma. The municipal offices for the new town would be located in the former Ramsey Township building on Old Perth Road. The Elmont Town Hall became known as the Old Town Hall, and though there are still some municipal offices in it, it is widely known as a superb venue for concerts and other artistic events. In a daring move in the era of the burgeoning internet, a new print newspaper focused on the arts was launched in Elmont by the husband and wife team of Rob and Chris Riendo. 
One of the reasons we, we began the hum was because the model that the weekly papers were using at the time was often to come to an event, take a picture, and then the next week you would find out what you'd missed. Um, you know, so if it was something like an ongoing series or if it was a play that ran three weekends in a row, you had an opportunity to catch up and go. But if it was a one-off and, and you couldn't get to pre you know, advance notice, uh, you often miss things. And then you'd have to go to the library or, or to, you know, before, before uh, the Miller's Tale, you'd have to go to the library or the grocery store and look at the whole rack of posters and flyers, figure out which ones were in your community, which ones were still coming up and hadn't passed already. And, and it, was, it was difficult. So there was, there was more going on than most people knew, but that was a problem. People didn't know all of the things that were going on. So, so yes, we started a print newspaper um, at a time when that might not have been, if we'd looked just at the, the bigger picture, the numbers game, um, or the, you know, the situation in big cities, we might never have, have done that. People seemed interested in what we were putting out. Um, I really credit the initial, the original editors, uh, Jill McCubbin and Heather Farkerson. They were, they were writing quirky, wonderful, first person, uh, very personal, warm stories uh, that I think people really connected with and, and about local folks and local endeavors. And then there was that, there was enough of a, you know, a, a sense of pride of place and, and supporting what was going on locally that, that, you know, within a year, it was going in the right direction. Mill Street was beginning to bounce back after the exodus of major businesses to the business park. There was a period of time when there was like uh, like a 40% vacancy rate in downtown Alma. And that was a little scary. You know, we, we wondered ourselves how long we could last. And then, slow but sure, you got some new people with new ideas and new ventures that came into our core. And as things started, to, you know, success breeds success. Uh, people see an idea and they say, oh, well, you know, so and so is doing really well with that idea. Hmm, I've got this idea that I'd like to try. Now's the time. You know, now's the time to to bring it forward and, and, and to do something with it. Um, we have, I mean, we don't have the typical core business services anymore. Uh, we don't have the drug stores. We don't have the hardware stores. Um, but it's the mix of stores that we have. We have a, a, a group of, you know, relatively young entrepreneurs um, who have new energy. And at that time, you know, if you go back even just 10 years ago, when a space went, you know, when, when somebody decided to close a business, it often took one to two years to lease that space. Today, you know, we've got a beautiful main street. We have lots and lots of improved spaces, redeveloped spaces, condominiums, you know, multiple restaurants, arts organizations, uh, all active. And today it takes not a year or two, but a month or two when a space goes empty. The Millennium saw a continuation of the transition of the downtown area into the dynamic and exciting heritage center and artistic focal point that it is today. Stephen Brathwaite partnered with Al and Barb Potvan to buy Thoburn Mill. It was later converted into condos and small offices. When it came time to, to start another company, uh, everything was here. And not only do we have space, uh, we're actually privileged to be able to own our space. We own a uh, condominium in, in the Thoburn Mill, and that's where the company uh, has its home. And I think the people who've restored the buildings in the town have done a tremendous job. I mean, Thoburn Mill, what a thoughtful and careful and sensitive restoration of, of a building. In addition, the downtown area now boasted a number of excellent restaurants. 2002 saw the start of yet another favorite concert series, the Focus Series. The first band featured was Elmont's own Ragged Flowers. Also in 2002, Neil Corp Homes would begin to change the face of the town as they started to build their first of several subdivisions. Right now, we, we've got, uh, what, one, two, three subdivisions on, on the go now. Uh, they're finishing up the, the Gale Street area there, or the Spring Street area, and uh, the little one up, uh, up of Augusta Street, it's complete now. It's 31 units up there.
but the uh, mill run is about 500 units and uh, it's big. So you, you, you take 2.5 people per unit, that's the way they work it out. So you got about 1,500 people, 1,800 people right there. A new business sets up in the industrial park, and of note, it's a manufacturer. It also happens to be an example of clean manufacturing that is ideally suited to the town. Our company, Sports Systems Canada, is a manufacturer and installer of athletic facility equipment and we uh, uh, manufacture and install custom tailored solutions for universities, uh, parks and recreation departments, uh, public and private schools, uh, YMCAs. We uh, sell across Canada and uh, lately we've been actually selling some of our products and expertise across the world. We did uh, install protective spectator netting at uh, the Almont Arena a number of years ago, uh, but more recently some of our higher profile projects include uh, the construction of the University of Ottawa GG Stadium um, located at 200 Lees Avenue just off the Queensway. That's a 3,400 seat complex um, that uh, we finished up earlier this year. In fact, the project went over into the winter of uh, 2013 and more recently, um, we had provided, uh, supplied and installed uh, a 3,000 seat system at uh, the Carleton University's Keith Harris Field. The facility managers at Carleton liked what we did at Ottawa University and had contracted us at the University of Ottawa and had contracted us to install a similar uh, grandstand system for their football program. From a business perspective, we're close to the U.S. border. Um, as far as shipping goods to uh, the Golden Horseshoe, Southern Ontario, everything is within a day um, for uh, freight shipment. I mean, you can't ship something from Brampton to Mississauga in less than a day. Everything takes at least a day, right? So uh, as far as we're concerned, we're on a fairly, uh, a fairly even playing field with some of the larger companies, uh, some of the other companies in our industry in the Toronto area. Um, great place to have a business, um, great community, and uh, not a lot of traffic. <laughs> Puppets Up started in August and was a smash. 2014 will see its 10th anniversary. fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Bruce was really interested in uh, the whole idea and he actually thought up the whole concept of the tents and right downtown and uh, people having free street entertainment as they wandered from venue to venue and music and color and kind of like a medieval fair and uh, and we still have that same formula and it seems to work, and um, people pay to get into the uh, theaters to see the actual shows. But along the way, they have uh, jugglers, clowns, musicians, all set up on the main street of Almont. Well, in Puppets Up, we do bring uh, each year 10 troops um, from Canada, the United States, and elsewhere. We've had uh, puppeteers here from Russia, Taiwan, Iceland, um, Ch um, this year it's Italy, and last year it was Hungary. So over the course of our 10 years, we've brought quite a lot of international puppet troops. Each year we try to bring two international troops and three American troops and five Canadians. That's sort of how... I try to work it. Another major retail move took place when Levi Home Hardware opened up its new location on Ottawa Street. Gord Pike would turn the original IGA site into a new multi-unit indoor shopping mall. And, and look at the really sensitive job that Gord Pike did with the Heritage Mall. I mean, what a tremendous and sensitive and thoughtful restoration on the main street. You, if, if Development in the town continues on that vector, 
um, this will be a gem preserved for many generations to come. Hopefully uh, the rejuvenation of the downtown and the project downtown is a little little thank you and a little way to, to say thank you to the community and uh, a small token of appreciation to give back to, uh, to the community and uh, just thank you. The river walk was extended up to the old town hall in 2005. An extensive part of it runs over the water and under the railroad bridge. I mean, I think the best thing that Almont ever did was to put a river walkway in. I mean, I remember talking about that years and years ago, and I thought to myself, it'll never be done, and it was done. And people just love that, to be able to, to you know, to, they park their car here, they walk across the river walkway, they can go and have a drink at the pub, they can, they can either sit there and have supper, or they can go to one of the other three great restaurants on the main street, and then to be able to walk home. In 2006, a 52-year-old iconic Elmont business, Cary Funeral Homes, was sold to Tubman Funeral Homes of Ottawa. I, I do feel a bit bad that we did sell as soon as we did, but in a small town, to get somebody to come in and buy a business and get out of it what you have already built up, uh, it's not an easy thing. And Julie Tubman phoned and said they'd like to come out and talk to us. Well, I said, I will set a price on it and there'll be no dickering. I said, if I don't get that price, I have to keep working it. Well, she said, we'd really like to come out. So they come out and they agreed, yes, they'd pay the price. And I said, well, all right, if you are definite, you want to. We'll open the books to you, and then you take it from there. If you decide you don't want it, that's fine, but there'll be no dickering on the price. That was fine, and that's what we ended up with. And uh, when the fact that they were going to take the two of them, that was the only way we would consider selling. The first shovel hit the ground in a massive upgrading to Elmont General Hospital and Fairview Manor. The project was funded by a $4.3 million grant from the provincial government. When we went to, uh, went to the hospital in 1980, it was a relatively small 35-bed hospital with probably 65, 75 employees. Um, to the organization, I guess in 2010, when I retired, we had grown to about 450 employees. And um, so with the various expansion, whether it was the Rosmond Wing or the uh, new Fairview Manor, it always comes back down to the programming that we put in place. Um, that was, uh, I look back with a great deal of satisfaction that we were able to accomplish that. And, uh, but I didn't do it alone. There were lots of, uh, lots of important links along the way and individuals who uh, helped the cause. The completed facility was officially opened in 2008 by Premier Dalton McGuinty. An Elmont tradition for almost 150 years, the fair made a surprising move from its longtime September time slot to mid-July. The move was forced because of difficulties in getting a midway. 2010 saw the New Mississippi River Power Corporation's new hydroelectric generating station located on the Lower Falls. It would almost double the output of the old station, bringing its capacity up to 4.6 megawatts. The distribution of medical services underwent a significant transition as the Ottawa Valley Family Health Team opened in November 2010. I just want to say we have a great team of doctors in town. Um, like I said, for instance, making a point of covering emergency entirely by ourselves, even though there were six or seven of us at some point, or five of us, or, you know, well, there were four, and then there were five, six, seven, and then ten, but uh, just covering all our own emergencies, I think that just speaks to the spirit of the medical community in the in in Almont. and uh, honestly, I think it's fair to say we all get along very well. 
we have different styles. We're all different, but I mean, that's great actually. The following year, the husband and wife team of Val Sears, a well-known longtime journalist, and Edith Cody Rice would launch an online community newspaper called The Millstone. No print newspaper could survive in a town this size anymore, I don't think, because they have all their costs and they have to get the money from somewhere and the advertising base is not large enough. So we thought that we would start the Millstone as a public service. Really, our philosophy is very simple. Uh, we want to be a community newspaper for the town of Mississippi Mills. We want to be a public service and uh, we want to be a citizen reporting newspaper, which we are. He just went, she does all the work. I just stand around and criticize. So. She's uh, doing a very good job, and we've got um, 7,000. Over 7,000. Over 7,000 subscribers. And we get, this month, we've had 12,000 hits. 2012 witnessed the new $25 million waste treatment facility come online. The new plant presently offers capacity to serve the growth needs of the Elmont Ward through 2031, when the population of the serviced area is expected to reach over 8,000. The final nail in the history of the railroad in Elmont was removed on July 12, 2012. We fought it. We certainly fought it. Mm. And if you uh, go back through the paper files and Lanark County files and whatnot. Um, we even went up to Parliament Hill on the coldest bloody day of the year um, and had a, well, we had all sorts of stuff up there, standing up there with all politicians. We had a busload of politicians up there. We just, all of us, both Renfrew and Lanark County, uh, wanted to see the railway stay. And the reason we wanted to see it stay is because it had potential. Uh, we sadly missed the, the trains going through Elmont 30 years ago. When we were kids, my cousin and I used to put pennies on the track. And as you grow up and watch, it's a pain in the butt when the track split the town in two. And you'd always get stuck here and you're trying to get to the other side of town. But now the train whistle doesn't blow anymore. It's a sad, sad thing. You miss it. You don't know what you got till it's gone. As 2013 draws to a close, one thing is very clear. Elmont has changed substantially in the last 50 years. It has enjoyed great times. It has endured and overcome hard times. It has indeed transitioned from a self-contained blue-collar mill town into a fascinating mix of bedroom community, artistic center, and tourist destination. It will be interesting to see what the next 53 years brings for the town. There is every reason to believe that it will just keep on getting better.